Wobble the Witch Cat by Mary Calhoun. Once upon a Halloween, there was a good witch named Maggie who owned a very grumpy witch cat named Wobble. They lived together in a teetery little house on the edge of town. Maggie was a fat, chuckling old lady with short gray hair. Wobble was as cross as he was black. He hadn't always been cross. Once he had been just as good as Maggie. It was all the fault of a new broomstick that Maggie had gotten for the last Halloween. It had a thin, slippery handle, and it was so hard to ride on that a Wobble was afraid he would fall off. He had even tried wrapping his tail around the stick, but he just couldn't balance on the thin seat. Just as the broomstick rose from the ground, he did fall off. He climbed on again quickly, but it gave him a bad scare. What's worse, all the other witch cats had laughed at Wobble as he wobbled across the sky. Now it was almost Halloween again, and Wobble grew very cross as he worried about riding the broomstick. He grumped, and he yowled, and he ran under Maggie's feet, just on purpose. Only yesterday he had almost upset the old lady as she carried her pans of witch's brew to the oven. She was making magic wish cookies to set out for the children when they came trick-or-treating. Wobble refused to go out and howl on fences as a proper witch cat should. Instead, he crouched in a corner, twitching his whiskers and grumbling to himself about the broomstick. The day before Halloween, he even knocked the jack-o'-lantern out of the window. That evening, Maggie said gaily, Tomorrow night, we ride again. And Wobble, that unhappy cat, actually humped his back and spat at her. Spat at his old friend, Maggie. Late that night, while Maggie slept, Wobble went tip, tip, tip on his soft black feet to the broom closet. There hung the witch's broomstick, shining faintly with magic, all ready for Halloween. Wobble grabbed the stick with his teeth and pulled it down. Out the back door he pulled it, out through the backyard, out to the trash barrel. He pushed the broom into the barrel, and then he scampered back to the house for a good night's sleep. Early the next morning, the rubbish truck came along and took the witch's broomstick away. All that day, Wobble was in a much better temper. When the sky began to darken and Maggie got out her black cape and pointed black hat, Wobble just licked his fur and purred. Time to dust off my broomstick and get ready to go, Maggie told him. We must sweep the stars clean in our part of the sky so the children here will be able to see when they go trick-or-treating. Wobble just grinned a black witch cat grin. Maggie went to the broom closet and opened the door. The broomstick was gone. There was only a great empty place where the broom usually hung. Oh, fiddle. Now, where did I put that broom? Maggie worried. I keep it hanging in this closet all year. She looked on the back porch. No broomstick. The witch cat chased his tail. Maggie scurried all over the house, peering into every nook and cranny, but no broomstick anywhere. Wobble danced on his hind legs, pretending he was chasing a fly. Oh, dear, where is my magic broomstick, the old witch cried. We can't fly up into the sky without it, and there's no time to go to the witch of the mountain for a new one. Wobble sat down and tried to look sad, but his yellow eyes gleamed. It's almost dark now, Maggie muttered, pulling at her hair. Whatever shall we do? I wonder if I have an extra broom in the closet. She opened the closet door again. No, there was nothing in the closet but her vacuum cleaner. Maggie started to turn away. Then she looked back at the vacuum cleaner. What was that strange glow about it? Galloping ghosts, she shouted. It looks magic. All year the broom had been hanging over the vacuum cleaner in the closet. Maybe the magic of the broom dripped off onto the vacuum cleaner, Maggie cried. Maybe the cleaner will fly. Wobble stopped waving his long tail and began to look worried. We'll just have to try it, the old witch said. All the other witches will be out sweeping their parts of the sky. What a disgrace if our piece of sky is dirty on Halloween night. Come on, Wobble. She smacked on her pointed black hat and pulled the vacuum cleaner out into the backyard. But Wobble ran under the stove. He crouched there, yowling with fear. Maggie got down on her knees and tried to pull him out. Nice, Wobble. Don't be afraid, she tried to soothe him. The cat just braced his feet and growled. At last, Maggie had to drag him out. She tucked him tightly under her arm and went back to the vacuum cleaner. 
The machine glowed strangely in the moonlight. Now I'll ride on the handle and you can ride on the bag in back, she told Wobble. And don't you dare jump off. Wobble sat down stiffly and dug his claws into the cloth of the bag. He hoped the vacuum cleaner wouldn't fly. Abracadabra, sis, boom, ba! Maggie shouted. The vacuum cleaner trembled, gave a jerk, and up into the air it rose. High into the Halloween sky sailed Maggie and Wobble on the magic vacuum cleaner. Suddenly, Wobble realized something wonderful. The vacuum cleaner's bag made a nice wide seat. He wasn't wobbling. Meow, he cried happily. Then he curled up on the bag and began to lick his fur. Wobble was going to enjoy this Halloween ride. As Maggie and Wobble flew near a flock of witches, all the cats screeched with laughter. Here comes Wobbling Wobble. And then they stared in surprise. For Wobble flipped his tail smartly at them and sailed on by, comfortable as on his own cushion at home. When the boys and girls came out of their houses, dressed as clowns and cowboys and witches and ghosts, they looked up at the sky. Oh, oh, cried a little girl in a red riding hood cape. I think I saw a witch up there. But what's she riding on? The other children looked up and sure enough, flying across the moon was a little speck. It looked like a witch and a cat doing loop-the-loops on a vacuum cleaner. Georgie by Robert Bright In a little village in New England, there was a little house which belonged to Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker. Up in the little attic of this little house, there lived a little ghost. His name was Georgie. Every night at the same time, he gave the loose board on the stairs a little creak, and the parlor door a little squeak, and then Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker knew it was time to go to bed. And Herman the cat, he knew it was time to prowl. And as for Miss Oliver, the owl, she knew it was time to wake up and say, Hoo. And so it went, with everything as it should be, until Mr. Whitaker took it into his head to hammer a nail into the loose board on the stairs and to oil the hinges of the parlor door. And so the stairs wouldn't creak anymore, and the door wouldn't squeak anymore. And Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker didn't know when it was time to go to bed anymore. And Herman, he didn't know when it was time to begin to prowl anymore. And as for Miss Oliver, she didn't know when to wake up anymore and went on sleeping. And Georgie sat up in the attic and moped. That was a fine how-do-do. Pretty soon, though, Georgie decided to find some other house to haunt. But while he ran to this house, and then to that house, each house already had a ghost. The only house in the whole village which didn't have a ghost was Mr. Gloam's place. But that was so awfully gloomy. The big door groaned so. And the big stairway moaned so. And besides, Mr. Gloams himself was such a crotchety old man, he came near frightening Georgie half to death. So Georgie ran away to a cow barn where there lived a harmless cow. But the cow paid no attention to Georgie. She just chewed her cud all the time, and it wasn't much fun. Meanwhile, a lot of time went by, and it rained a good deal. And during the winter, it snowed to beat the band. And out of the cow barn, Georgie was terribly cold and uncomfortable. But what with the dampness from the rain and the coldness from the snow, something happened to that board on the Whitaker stairs and to the hinges on the Whitaker parlor door. It was Herman who discovered it and told Miss Oliver. And she woke up with a start. Miss Oliver flew right over to the cow barn to tell Georgie that the board on the stairs was loose again and that the hinges on the parlor door were rusty again. What glad tidings that was for Georgie. He ran right home, lickety-split. And so, at the same old time, the stairs creaked again, and the parlor door squeaked again, and Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker knew when it was time to go to sleep again. 
and Herman, he knew when to begin to prowl again. And as for Miss Oliver, she knew when it was time to wake up again and say, Whoo! Thank goodness. Georgie's Halloween by Robert Bright. Wherever there are children, there is Halloween, with pumpkins and funny faces, with tricks and with treats. But in the little village where Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker lived, there was always something extra besides, and that was Georgie, the little ghost who lived in the Whitaker attic. Every Halloween, while the children went trick-or-treating, blowing horns, banging dishpans, making all the loud noises, Georgie went a-haunting with his friends, Herman the Cat and Miss Oliver the Owl. But while the children rang doorbells and shouted boldly for treats, Georgie stayed hidden. And maybe you saw him, just maybe, and maybe you didn't. And that was just as it should be, because Georgie was a gentle little ghost and he was shy. Now, everything would have gone on just as usual year after year, except that one Halloween was different. That was the time they had a notion to give a big party for all the children on the village green, and Mr. Whitaker himself was chosen to present the prize for the best Halloween costume. That Halloween, everybody dressed up special. Herman did, Miss Oliver did, Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker did, and rode to the green in style. Everybody dressed up special except Georgie, because Georgie didn't have to. He was so especially perfect for Halloween, just as he was. It just didn't seem proper that Georgie shouldn't go to the party and win the prize. All the mice in the attic thought he should. Herman thought so, Miss Oliver did, and they called to Georgie. The pumpkin in the parlor window grinned at Georgie. The Halloween moon in the sky smiled at him. But while Georgie went to the party on the green and saw the apple bobbing and pinning the tail on the donkey, he stayed hidden. And maybe you saw him, just maybe, and maybe you didn't. And when it was time for the prize contest to begin and the children crowded around the bandstand, Georgie wasn't anywhere near enough. Just the same, he was curious, and it did seem like such fun. Besides, Herman and Miss Oliver urged him on, and so presently he did come nearer, and a little nearer, until he was right behind a corn shock that decorated the bandstand, where he had the best kind of view. That seemed plenty good enough for Georgie, except that Herman kept meowing at him so, and Miss Oliver kept hoo-hooing at him so, urging him to be brave. And so Georgie screwed up every bit of courage he had. Now, Mr. Whittaker did not see him even then. He was so busy looking the wrong way. But the children saw him and recognized their favorite little ghost. And so they shouted all together, It's Georgie! It's Georgie! If only they had not shouted quite so loud. Or if only Mr. Whittaker had looked around a little quicker. Because he could have sworn that somebody, somebody had tugged at his coattail. But Georgie was gone in a second. Georgie was running home lickety-split to tell the mice in the attic about it, and all the way he could still hear the children cheering him. Now, the mice understood why Georgie ran lickety-split back to the attic, because they were so shy themselves. They had a special surprise for Georgie, and maybe it was the best kind of prize for Halloween because it had come right out of a very old, creaky and squeaky bureau drawer. At that, Georgie was so happy and pleased he might well have forgotten everything else. But even tonight, as soon as Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker were home again, Georgie did not forget to creak the stairs, just as usual, or to squeak the parlor door, just as usual, and Herman did not forget to prowl after his favorite mouse, and Miss Oliver did not forget to sing her owl song, just as she always did in her favorite tree. As for Mr. and Mrs. Whitaker, they were still so puzzled and betwizzled by what had happened on the green that while they went to bed as they should, they forgot to blow out the pumpkin in the parlor window. But Georgie took care of that. Thank goodness.
Cat, the Witch's Cat by Geraldine Ross. In the crags of Crazy Mountain, near the boiling fire fountain, lived a witch named Mrs. Stitch. She owned a pot in which to stew quite a lot of witch's brew, a pointed hat, a battered broom, and pets enough to fill a room. A snake named Jake, an owl named Skull, a bat named Brat, a crow named Joe, and best of all, a black and small, thinly flat cat named Scat. Jake and Brat loved the cave. They were brave. Scowl and Joe loved it too. They were new. But Scat would leave if he dared. He was scared. He hated all the wicked witches, all their dens and all their ditches. He wished his fur were smooth as silk. He wanted saucers filled with milk. As witches go, his witch was rich. But poor Scat hated Mrs. Stitch. Night after night, day after day, he plotted how to get away. The old witch muttered as she stirred. The poor cat shuddered at each word. When Mrs. Stitch would dance and leap, Scat shivered even in his sleep. He dreamed of fish and mice and toys. He dreamed of gentle girls and boys. He dreamed of naps and soft, deep laps and petted fur and a... Uh, her. He wakened when the old witch cackled and the fire hissed and crackled. Then all his lovely dreams would melt. And oh, how scared and sad he felt. On Halloween, a witch is queen. On Halloween, all witches zoom through the gloom on a broom. Mrs. Stitch took Brat the Bat and poor frightened little scat on her broom and wild and high... They flew like wind across the sky. Forth and back, back and forth, west and east, south and north, Scat could hear the old witch fret, faster, faster, faster yet. The bat was glad, the witch went mad, but poor Scat huddled, scared and sad, and in the middle of a yell he lost his hold, and down he fell. Through the night, dark and dim, with her screams after him, down, down to the town, followed by her ugly frown. With his eyes wide and green, Scat plunged into Halloween. Where the alleys and the streets milled and spilled with tricks and treats, like a black wind-tattered rag, he fell into an open bag. In the middle of the bars, the nuts, the chocolate cigars, the apples and the lollipops, the popcorn and the lemon drops, among the cookies, sweet and fat, there was Scat, the witch's cat. His delight was quite complete when a blue-eyed boy named Pete yelled, I got a special treat. Scat is happy. Scat is good. Behaving as a good cat should. Only, when the witches ride, he will never stir outside and his eyes bright and green close up tight on Halloween. Pumpkin Moonshine by Tasha Tudor. Sylvie Ann was visiting her grandmummy in Connecticut. It was Halloween, and Sylvie wanted to make a pumpkin moonshine. So she put on her bonnet and started out for the cornfield to find the very finest and largest pumpkin. The cornfield was on top of the hill, quite away from the house, so Sylvie took Wiggy for company. The hill was very steep. It made Sylvie and Wiggy puff like steam engines. When they reached the field, Sylvie looked among the shocks of corn for the very fattest pumpkin. Way across the field, she found such a fine one. It was so very big, Sylvie couldn't lift it. So instead, 
she rolled it across the field just the way you rolled big snowballs in wintertime. But when Sylvie and Wiggy and the pumpkin came to the edge of the field where the ground sloped down into the barnyard below, the pumpkin began running away. It leapt over stones and bushes, bumpity bump bump, faster, faster down the hill with Sylvie and Wiggy rushing after it. It frightened the goats. It terrified the hens. It enraged the geese as it tore into the barnyard at a truly dreadful speed. But worst of all, it bumped right into Mr. Hemmelskamp, who was carrying a pail full of whitewash. It didn't stop till it hit the side of the house. Kerthumpity, bumpity, thump. Sylvie Ann was a very polite little girl. So, of course, she helped Mr. Hemmelskamp to his feet before going after the pumpkin. She apologized to the goats and poultry, too. Then Sylvie went to her grandpop and told him what happened, so he came out and cut the top off that runaway pumpkin. Sylvie scooped all the seeds and pulp out. Then grandpop made eyes and a nose and a big grinning mouth with horrid, crooked teeth. It was evening by then, so they put a lighted candle inside the pumpkin to make him look as fierce and horrid as all true pumpkin moonshines should. Sylvie and Grandpop put the pumpkin moonshine on the front gate post. Then they hid in the bushes to watch how terrified the passers-by would be at the sight of this fierce pumpkin moonshine. They had a wonderful time. Sylvie Ann saved the pumpkin seeds. Next spring, she planted them. The vines grew up and ran all over the cornfield with lots of pumpkins on them, just waiting to be made into pumpkin pies and pumpkin moonshines to please good little girls like Sylvie Ann.